Good morning. Welcome to church. Come on in. Find a spot. As soon as you found that spot, you can, if you're able, you can stand with us and we're going to sing. See you today. 
Understanding. Yes, if you call for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to depth, death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of good and keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather together here. Thank you so much for this fellowship of saints. Thank you that we can praise and worship you together in song. Thank you that we can hear your word faithfully exposited to us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Be with us this morning. May you be glorified in everything we hear, everything we sing, everything we say and do. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I invite you to stand together with us again.
Take up my cross and follow the sun. Let it be my life's refrain to live as Christ, to die as King. Deny myself, take up my cross and follow the sun. Christ we proclaim, name above every name, from all creation, every nation, God's salvation through the sun. Christ we
Please be seated. Good morning. There is kids bin. Thanks to Jenna for filling in to for Michelle. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll be reading 1 to 8 this morning. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. By be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth this there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Father God, we thank you for this morning, we thank you for the beautiful weather we have, thank you for all you have blessed us with. 
Lord, we thank you for the church, and we thank you for the word that we are given and the word that we are able to proclaim. We pray that that would be the centrality of all we do, because from your word is our only source of truth. Can we go out and know what is true in our lives and what we can cling to? And we pray that you would be with me as I speak, that only what is said would come from you, and to the listener that what is heard would also be your word and your word alone. So we pray this all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> if I was feeling a little bit in a journalist moved, mood and headed into town and would start interviewing some people, I'd be interested if I would ask them, those who go to church, and I'd ask them why they go to the church they do. I wonder what the leading responses would be. My guess is in this area, one of the main ones would be, well, that's my, where my family goes. I grew up there. I've always gone there. Or it might be a church that provides the programs they like, so they enjoy it's a good place for their kids to go. It might be a warm church. They might enjoy the hospitality of it. They find the people very warm there. Or they might be attracted to the speaker. They enjoy going to hear him preach. And all these in and of themselves are not bad things. They're all good things, in fact. Here, I wonder, though, if I were to ask our people, I wonder what the leading answer would be. I would hope that if someone would ask you why you come to this church, that your answer would be because they preach the word. And that's exactly what Paul is getting at in this passage this morning. The centrality and foundation of the preached word of Christ. And it's an emotional letter. If you act, we go back and read through it, especially the first couple verses, I won't have time to go through them now, but you just hear in Paul's voice the emotion of it, his love for his spiritual son, Timothy. And it's also emotional because we know this is the last uh, words that Paul ever wrote, and he would have known it. He would have known that he was about to be shortly martyred. He was in a jail in Rome, and he would be shortly beheaded. And in summary, he's telling Timothy how to endure against suffering, difficulties, frustrations, and how people will come and go. People will turn away from the faith. But he's telling Timothy to persevere. And as a good teacher does, a lot of his teaching isn't in the don'ts. He doesn't have a lot of don't do this, don't do that. It's positives, positive imperatives. And he's telling him to do it, do it by preaching truth. And a lot of it's very simple, actually. It's not a complicated instruction. Back in 2.8, he says, remember Jesus Christ. Well, why would he tell him to remember Jesus Christ? Obviously, Timothy would remember Jesus Christ. No, what he's telling there is, remember the gospel. Remember what it is to remember Christ. And uh, this letter is full of foundational statements, the one we often recite, 316, about all scriptures God breathed, profitable for teaching, for truth. And that kind of fits that it comes just before he sets up, telling Timothy to preach the word. And if, for me, whenever I read this, I think it should be in capital letters with a couple exclamation point marks behind it. I hear Paul writing in his voice saying, preach the word a little more with authority. And you may be thinking, well, this is good for a, pre or a seminar on preaching. Is this a passage then just to a room of aspiring preachers? Well, hopefully I can show you this morning, this is for everyone in the church. Like most of Paul's letters, they were meant to be read publicly. In some of his other letters, he even includes, read this among the brothers, even this letter, as personal as it is to Timothy, both First and Second Timothy end with the grace be with you, and not being much of a Greek scholar, but enough to know that we don't have in the Greek the word you. They actually have a word when it's singular or plural. And both times it's used at the end of both of these letters. It's in the plural form that Paul is saying, grace to you, you the church. And why it would have been helpful for the church to hear this all? Because it promotes unity. 
It's good for the whole body to know how the church should function. Just like we have qualifications for elders, and it's good for the whole church to know that. Why we should all know those passages. I'm kind of interested when I've actually been asked, what do you think? We're looking for a pastor. What do you think we should look for in a pastor? Well, I'd start by maybe looking in Timothy. Oh, what does it say there? Well, I think if you're on a pastoral search committee, it would be good to know these things, right? Instead of making up our own ideas, what do we want in a pastor? What do we want in an elder? What do we want in preaching? And kind of imagine, let's say, hopefully not, but the way things are headed, who knows? Not to scare you, Bob or Dylan, but imagine, let's say, our elders all got arrested, and to probably all your fear, they would give me a letter saying, you're in charge, this is how you're supposed to run the church. And if any of you would come back, it would be probably better instead of just me taking that and running with it. How much better for the church if I'd read that to you all and we would all know what we are aspiring to do. And here, this is why it's not also just for the preacher, but for the listener. As much as preaching and the preacher should know what it is, the listener plays a big part on the other end. But we also don't still want to lose the personal element of this letter. There is still a personal element of Paul writing to Timothy that we still want to take in. And we sense the urgency in it. Throughout the book, it's just full of, I urge you, I charge you, remember, be reminded. All these things you hear Paul stressing to Timothy. You hear the passion in his voice and his writing. So if we start off, the first two verses, we see here the call of the preacher, and we see the seriousness of it, the heaviness of it. Verse 1, Paul begins, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. We see here the eternal focus already that preaching has. Preaching is done, not just for the here and now, but in light of eternity. What is preaching? Is there a difference between teaching and preaching? Well, Calvin defined preaching. Calvin said preaching is the public public exposition of God's word by the man called by God, done in the presence of Christ, who sits in judgment and grace. That'll put a little bit of fear in anyone who wants to try this. Thinking if Christ came back, I think, may he find me preaching a gospel when I'm not side of things. If Christ were to come back, may he find me listening to the gospel message. This is why preaching, and what is preaching the gospel? Preaching the gospel is simply thinking any message that is preached And you wonder, was that a Christian message? There's a very easy test. Did the blood of Christ have to be shed for that message to be preached? Because if no blood was necessary for that message, you don't have a Christian message. Then it could be preached by anyone. It's very easy. A lot of us have probably just ingrained in us that the message of the cross is one to lead to conversion. So we preach the cross to change hearts and convert people. But once I've been converted, like, well, what do I need that message for? I'm a Christian. Now I need to hear the rest, right? Well, it's maybe good to have some gospel messages in case there's still some unbelievers. We still want to convert people. But we lose sight that the gospel is just as much post-conversion as what leads up to it. Closest thing I can think of the old line kind of when we think of a wife wanting to hear I love you from a husband, and he says, well, I told you on our wedding day I love you. If anything changes, I'll let you know. And we all laugh at that, but why do we treat the gospel that way? As if, well, the message of the cross, I accepted it, I'm converted. Now what do I need it for? I'm good. Now I want to hear how to live. No, we have just as much a need as we need to hear those I love yous. 
We need to hear that gospel message over and over because our hearts are so prone to wander and forget this. So here in verse 2, Paul will give seven verbs. He gives the big one, preach the word. And he follows that up with six more, explaining how to do it. When he said, preach the word to Timothy, Paul knew that this was exactly Timothy's only hope of survival. Historically, when we define what is the true church, the church has always been defined by three marks. The proper... uh, Drawing a blank on the word. Anyway, proper giving of the sacraments, church discipline, and the preached word. And probably of these three, the most important is the preached word of God. because It is the primary means of which people can be saved. Not just saved, but also sanctified. For as much as we always preach sola scriptura, we don't hear as much about tota scriptura, the totality of scripture. That's why expositional preaching is so important. Walking through books of the Bible is because it doesn't let you dodge anything. Every word of God is meant for the Christian. And at least when it's done correctly. So you ask, well, what does it done correctly mean? Preaching the word of God correctly means that you just proclaim exactly what the text says. The word preacher actually comes from the Roman world. They would have had what were heralds, someone who would just proclaim whatever the Caesar of the day would want to say. Let's say a child was born to Caesar or a big battle was won. A herald would simply just go out and announce what happened. It wasn't his job to change the message. It wasn't his job to do anything with it. He was simply told, this happened, go tell the people. And that is the call of the preacher, to proclaim the message. And yes, we do want to give imperatives how to live this out, but we want to focus a lot more. Our job is not to tell people how to live. We proclaim the message. We look backward, proclaim what has already been done. We come to the text then and ask, what is it trying to say? This is exegesis. This is exegetical preaching. This is what forms our sermons. As contrary to eisegesis. Eisegesis means we read into ourselves what we want the text to say. So you kind of see the opposite. One says, I come, let the text tell me what to say. Let the text form my message. Versus... Now I'm going to come, I'm going to take a text, and I'm going to determine how this text can use what I want to say to get my point across. Always, we always want to remember that all the power is in the word and not in the speak, speaker. One of the handy things I think is actually feeling very inadequate was good for me because eventually early battling with, well, am I really good enough to do this? I don't know if I should be doing this. Like, I stumble. I'm not a very good speaker. Also, one day I thought, well, that's kind of perfect, right? As long as I think I'm no good, that's perfect. God's got me where he wants me. In fact, it actually, and a compliment to the church. We can tell the church isn't, here our church isn't here to hear a speaker. They're here because the word is preached. Early on, and this is honest, it actually bugged me when it was put in the bulletin Next week, guest speaker, Stu Reimer. I was like, Iris, don't put that in there because I'd rather have them come next week and then see it in there and, oh, he's pre... They saw, I can't leave. <laughs> but that shows that here, people do not come because it, because it would be very easy, right? Pastor Jared, yeah, I always thought, well, they'll see Jared's not preaching. Well, I'll come next week when he's back. That is how you see a church wants to hear the word and not a speaker. And we also want to notice what is in between those black lines, what's in the white lines, that white area. What preaching of the word is not. It is not having panel discussions up here. It is not having the youth do a drama. It is not having talks 
bringing in a choir, all these things which too can be good things done in the right timing. But those things are never to replace the preaching of the word. That is central to our worship. So then, how does Paul tell him, tell Timothy if he is to preach the word? Well, first of all, he tells him to do it in season and out of season. It is not a sometime thing, is what he's getting here. Preaching is very easy to do and it's popular, which is one of the benefits I've had, as I've said. I've only preached here and a few other churches that have asked me to come, but actually want to hear me and are accepting of me. But I'm sure if you talk to Pastor Jared or even talking to Jim, some of his experiences, it's not always going to be like that. There are times where people do not want to hear what you have to say. And I keep trying to prepare, prepare myself for that day when you don't have people actually accepting of your message. And I was preparing myself that the listeners will never determine what I have to say. I never want to put something in here that, oh, they might like that. Yeah, that might warm them up to me if I say that. There's room for illustrations. There's room for some humor when it's done in the right way or maybe off and think, just not planned. Not for the sake of we want to be just some killjoys that we don't ever want to laugh. But those things are often done with intentions of they can please the audience. People love stories, so it's easy to add, well, I got a good illustration. They'll really like this story. Oh, this will be a good joke to put in here. This will wake them up a bit. But what are you doing then? You're drawing people again to something other than the text. I would never want you to walk away from a message and if I'd bump into you a week later and say, oh, that was a good story you had. It's not very complicated when we can keep that centrality that Paul's imploring Timothy here. One of the things that I found easy and hard of being under Jared's mentorship is it wasn't complicated, Off, sometimes frustrating. I'd want a bit more. Give me a bit of guidance. Just preach the word. Okay, but what would you do here? Like, just preach the word. And it helped, made it easier. But if some of the answers I'd get, you remember Christmas. Well, Christmas, Sunday morning, like, is anyone going to come? And I love Jared's bluntness. Who cares? There's one person there. Preach the word. For interest, a little WhatsApp chats. You can do a bit of a chat search. So with him, I just typed in, preach the word. And I found how often it came up. The beginning saying, well, what if I don't preach as long? Like, I'll be shorter. Is that all right? I don't care about time. Preach the word. Right? That's what drives it. Nothing else matters. We don't need to concoct anything. Don't need to look for, worry about the small stuff. Just stay in here and we'll be all right. And we don't want to take it too far. I just thought to simply add this talk of, well, it doesn't matter about the listener. Does, we, people take that too far and they think, yeah, I'm such a word preacher, right? Well, I just preach the truth. I don't care if they like it. Well, I don't care if they don't like how I said it. No, that's a ditch going the other way. We never, which is common sense to almost anyone. But at some point, if you preach like that, just thinking, well, it's not about the listener. I just say what the text says, if they like it or not. No, at some point, you just become a jerk. If you actually don't know how to work this, that there is a line in the middle. You preach a message that is appealing. Why would you ever want to turn people away by preaching a harsh truth without knowing how to do it? And it's especially needed as we look at Paul's next three imperatives here. This is where great wisdom is needed. Wisdom and discernment. Because we lack these traits in the pulpit because many men are feared to do it. We see these words to reprove, to re uh, reprove, and where are we? 
Yeah, verse 2, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. We've lost biblical meaning of words. Simply, people would hear all three of these words and they just get lumped up. They all have one meaning. They all just mean to chastise. They're to be mean. It's interesting that there's actually a big difference when we understand words biblically. And I even found, even in a, not even a Christian dictionary, just seeing a search on words. And each of these words, it was funny how I saw a definition but then under them, they'd actually have, well, the biblical meaning. Then you'd see reprove. Well, then the biblical meaning. Like, there's a difference in these words. We've got to not let our co- uh, current culture determine what these words mean. To reprove, it means to convince, to kindly correct. To rebuke can be a little harsher, but it's still to strongly warn, to restrain. To exhort means to advise, to make urgent appeals. Well, all of a sudden you see how these words all of a sudden have great kindness and love behind them. It's an urgent appeal to correct people, to put them on the right way. It's for their own spiritual health. To see, I don't want you going here. I want to steer you here because I love and care for you. This is actually kindness, caring for souls. This is why, sadly, ministers who are afraid to do this and just want to speak nicely, they don't love people. They're actually just letting people go off course and think, I'm just going to encourage you. You keep steering left. You keep going off. Well, I just at least want to make you feel good doing it. And it gets a little harder in the end of verse 2, and he says, and do it with patience. Not just patience, complete patience. That can be extremely hard for anyone who wants to teach. We want change today. We want to feel like, okay, this matters right now. Like, are they getting it? What's wrong? Like, why can't he see this? It's as if I'm just preaching to a wall or I'm trying to help this person and they just don't care. Especially with young preachers. They want change very quickly and they get burnt out when they don't see it happen. The great Martin Lloyd-Jones said, what the young preacher wants to accomplish in one single jump, the old one has done step by step over the quarter of a century. And I often have to look to myself, a lot of the things that I was convicted of, struggled with, well, they took me a year or two to actually come to grips with, change a doctrine. Like, I fought with them and wrestled with them. And yet when I now tell, talk with other people, why, over an hour of coffee, I think, like, this is obvious. Like, what, you don't get it? Like, you're still going to keep believing? It's clear, right? I lack patience. Why can't I have the patience people had with me? And not just other people, if I feel guilted enough that I lack patience people gave me. I was really convicted. If you want to flip back a couple pages to 1 Timothy 1.16, and really want to feel a punch in the gut if you're someone who struggles with patience. 1 Timothy 1.16, but I, Paul speaking, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. If you ever find yourself impatient with others, go and read that verse and see if you find a little bit of conviction. So you just find yourself lacking patience, frustrated with someone else. Then you turn to your Savior, Savior, and what did he have? For a sinner like me, perfect patience to show his mercy and grace. Unbelievable, right? that Christ would show that kind of patience with me. And then it's pretty convicting at the smallest thing. I can't show patience to the next person. This is why we need great wisdom in keeping up with these things. And we'll see later the patience needed. If, I think it's common for a lot of us. Patience is actually easy with a total secular person. 
because they're blind, so I can actually think. They're blind, they can't see. We'll chip away with this little by little. Patience is often at its hardest. And what Paul's getting at here with Timothy is with a fellow Christian. Because you always think, well, you're a Christian. Like, you should know better. We, like, you should understand better. This is where patience is a lot more tested. Because patience, if you're like me, comes easier for an unbeliever. We can take the long road with them. We'll work at them. But we lack the same patience often for our fellow brothers because we think, no, you're here. I want you here. Like, why can't you just... No. And yet, it's sad, right, to our own fellow brother or sister. We can't show the patience that Christ showed us. But that kind of shows that we are so results-driven. A lot of what preaching is and lack of patience is in results. We'll touch on that a bit later. Then finally, we're also called to teach. Preaching, by definition, is a t- teaching vocation. What good is a messenger that can't explain his message? And the comfort is that the teaching is allowing Scripture to speak. But as Scripture speaks, it is the preacher's job to expose it correctly. Which is why Paul tells Timothy in, back in 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's one thing every minister, preacher, needs to take serious. The power of this word and the holiness of this word, that we ought to rightly handle the word of truth. Sadly, there is an epidemic of people filling pulpits who play fast and loose with Scripture, thinking they can take this book, take a bit of ideas from it, and form a message on it. Or in the name of cowardice, and in the name of humility, we got people who don't want to speak with authority and conviction and answer people when they have questions. Because it's kind of a false sense of humility, but you get a lot of it and don't want to get off on a pet peeve because I have such a passion for young people and the struggles they're dealing with in our culture, that teenage age. And if I may still be blunt, we have a lot of rightly intended youth ministers that are crushing a struggling youth. Why? Because of fear of actually pushing them, a fear of actually saying something that might upset them, making them think. So the 17-year-old comes to them and says, well, what about this? What about hell? And so they get an answer that seems helpful and doesn't, won't all of a sudden make them, like all of a sudden struggle with, say, well, Scripture's a hard book. We don't really know. Like, there's a lot of interpretations out there. It's complicated. No one knows for sure. So, yeah, just, we don't know. That doesn't help. That doesn't help a person, young, old, people who are struggling, people who do not want to speak speak with conviction. And yeah, secondary issues are different. There's room for different ideas on secondary matters. But let's give some people answers. At least try. We got the Word of God. And we don't even want to try to help a dying society, a wayward culture, by actually trying to give them some truth. One of the things I will never tell my children or anyone asking me a question, which seems, again, as if it's coming from we don't want to all sin complicate things, You know what? Just trust God. Pray about it. Don't worry about it. That is of no use to a struggling person. Good things, don't get me wrong. Trust God. Pray. 
Well, you got someone who's struggling and they come, and that's what they get. No, I'm struggling because I have no trust. I'm struggling because I don't even know what to pray about. I'm struggling because I don't even know, well, what do, where's my answers? We're not all going to be theologians. We're not all going to, no one has all the answers. But it is the duty, especially of the man called by God, to try. Try to give people what they need. See, it's often frowned upon nowadays for a pastor to spend his time in study. Right? Don't become that studious. Rather, the people need your time. People need to have you out there. That is why people don't tremble anymore as they come to preach. Why do people like Luther, Spurgeon, you'd think, why would they preach anymore with any sense of trembling? They do this every day. No one feared to preach to the people more than people like Spurgeon. You open up this book and you're speaking for God and you better never take that lightly. And ignorance is no excuse. I don't know if you've ever had this, someone who's been of influence to you, and they're such an influence to you that sometimes they don't even know what they say. They say it in passing, and yet it haunts you for years. One such thing I have from Pastor Jared, early on, before I even started this, just talking about it, and just in passing he said, if you're going to do this, there are days you're going to have to say no to the coffee and yes to the study. I didn't know how often that would be in the back of my head. Just, I think last time I preached, it's a long day and all I wanted to do was, all right, today we're just not going to do anything. I'm going to make a coffee. I'm going to go, today I'm just going to sit and watch a hockey game. And I think I even had my coffee made. I was even heading to the couch. And I heard that guy's voice in my head. Some days you're going to have to say no to the coffee and yes to the study. A man who wants to preach but spends no time in study simply has a desire to be seen and heard. Simply he wants to be up here and speak for himself if he's not willing to put in the time of what he has to say. Then in verse 3, Paul starts to warn Timothy about the listener. <clears throat> For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Funny that 2,000 years later, and nothing has changed much today, And we still have a lot of teachers who are happy to scratch those itching ears for many different reasons. But many teachers are happy to appeal to their people. This is why they preach either emotional messages that will speak to people's hearts or entertainment or even worse. They'll bring the Bible up here, but they'll use it to preach some other gospel But this is where it's the most deceiving. It's people, oh no, my preacher opens up the Bible. He preaches from it every Sunday. You can open up the Bible and not preach the Bible. You can u just use this as a method to preach a self-help gospel. And often it can lead. People often say then, oh, I feel sorry for people. I feel sorry for this people that are in such and such as church. Like, oh, I feel sorry for those people under that guy's preaching. Here there's an element he'll feel accountable. But what does verse 3 here say? The time is coming where people, people will not endure sound teaching, but they have itching ears and will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. The people are not left off the hook. They are there because they want to be. The teacher doesn't drag them in. These people go to that church because it's a message they want to hear. Paul doesn't say these people are tricked, doesn't say they're duped, 
deceived into coming. They're there because they want to be, because that message feels good to them. I thought about this. I honestly thought, take your whoever you want without naming names and whatever message they're preaching, as hard as it is to imagine, I think if those people would demand exegetical preaching, we want to hear the gospel, and they'd come out in droves. Thousands of people would come. And, all right, I'll name one name, just because it helps me. Smiling Joel down there in Texas. Right? It's hard to believe, but if all those people would beg of him to preach the gospel, I think he's doing it. I think next Sunday... He'd try his hardest to preach a gospel message because all of a sudden that's what the people want. So a lot of these preachers, I think they're not coming because this is what I want to teach. So I'm going to bring this to the people and hope they like it. A lot of these cases, that's actually backwards of what we think. Let's put some responsibility on the listener. They're coming. They want this message. All right, now the teacher is going to come. I'm going to accommodate for that. You bring the itch, I'll bring the scratch. That's what they want, right? So we have what I thought I was very clever that I came up with Petland Ecclesiology this week. A lot of churches think this is our mission. Feed them, water them, give them enough pets to keep them happy. And if they're ready for it, maybe a little bit of obedience training. So they accumulate for themselves teachers that suit their own passions. And if they don't like it, they'll move on. Like I said, I think these teachers, they, I don't think they're scared to preach on sin. I wonder if they'd actually, their fear isn't to preach on sin. Their fear is how preaching on sin will be received. That is what scares them to touch on sin, is that the people won't like it. This, there's a reason the self-help message, prosperity gospel, is so prevalent. Because it's what the people want. There's a reason social justice is taken off. It's what the people want. They want to hear a social justice message because it makes me feel valuable. Keep teaching me this, I can go out and do it. It's a perfect, we got a perfect relationship. You give me marching orders, you tell me what God wants me to do, I'll go do it, and I feel good about myself. So, a little bit of a hard-hitting commentary I heard this week. But where do lies get their power? In the idiocy of the deceive. Where did uh, the serpent's power come from? The serpent's, the power in his lie did not come from Adam. The power in that lie came from Eve. Or, yeah. Power in that lie was not in and of himself. The power wasn't in the serpent's message. The power was in Eve. Power in that lie was in Adam, accepting it. A lie is no good if it is never accepted. But, big but, let's not get caught up in condemning. Let's not be a church always looking over there, picking apart. Well, they're doing it wrong. Like, look at that church. Oh, that teacher, like, picking him apart. Picking those people. Oh, why do those people, they're so shallow, they go listen to this guy? Verse 5. Here we kind of see Paul is getting back to Timothy. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul's kind of getting back, all right? This is what people will do. This is what other teachers might do. Be aware of it. It's all right. We want to have our eyes and ears open, warn people. So it's good to know some of the pitfalls, what's going on. But at the end of the day, Paul's getting back. All right, Timothy, just be remember. This is going on out there. But do you. You take care of yourself. You take care of your own people. Take care of your own message. Don't get distracted. Because usually what happens when you worry so much what's going on out there, it pulls you away from what you should be doing in here. 
Example of this, a uh, prominent New York pastor passed away three days ago. And do I agree with everything in his theology? No, definitely some weak points, and I might have even warned people of it, might have even pointed some of them out in the past. So I'm not saying we never see flaws, but the message of his passing was, a couple hours old, and you got Christians getting on comments saying, oh yeah, false teaching, false, te- oh yeah, no one should listen. Like, really? Is that what we've come to that? A man where I'm still fully convinced it's a brother, that a couple hours, day after his passing and his family announces it, and you're going to jump on bad, maybe where you see flaws or weaknesses. To me, that is a person that Paul would be warning and say, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. People who get that caught up in what others are doing, I think they're pulled away from being proclaimers of the gospel. They kind of see themselves as a modern-day King Henry. They've put that own crown on their head. I'm the defender of the faith. They sometimes, and I think these people, I'm the only one. Right? You get people out there, which we all can sometimes fall into a bit of that, but thinking like, it is my duty for all of Christendom. I'm going to protect the purity of it. So I'm ready. Anyone who all of a sudden, yeah, I'm going to jump because I have it all, I'm ready to jump on anything that's wrong. Here, if you're, When he says, be sober-minded, maybe here is another word where it helps to study exactly what Paul means by that word. When he says, be sober-minded, he's meaning be single-focused. Just do what you're called to do. Be an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. That's your job. Don't fulfill other people's. You worry about you, be faithful. You be faithful, and the results are God's. It's kind of two mindsets of preaching. Those who think, I got to worry, do the right job, so the results will follow based on me or I'll just be faithful and God will take care of the results. What a blessing and comfort it is to preach knowing I don't have to worry about the results. Then in verse 6, he switches gears a little bit. If you'd go back and read the first three verses of 2 Timothy and see, or read these three verses, sorry. Read these final three verses where Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Drink offering, referring to the Old Testament offering, the drink offering, which was completely poured out. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now you go back and read 2 Timothy and you see why Paul is writing. You kind of read it in a different tone. You read the sense of urgency. You see just his heart going into this letter. Imagine it kind of like a dying father t- leaving instruction for his son. All of a sudden he's not talking about just the small things like whatever, clean up this or that. It's basically where he tells him now at the end, take care of the family. Like, take care of your mother. Like, now you're going to just centralize it and hit the main points where everything will follow. And now Paul no longer gives imperatives, but he shows himself as an example. One of the things we're thought of, especially where you may not realize it, I don't know where I am. Am I old, young? I think I'm in the middle because I'm still being influenced. So I'll say if you're older than me and you're those of you who are even really good at teaching and have a lot of wise things to say, I'll also let you know 
that just as much of your teaching in the church is done how you carry yourselves. A lot of the things is I'm trying to be, who knows where I'll ever go in some work, but done enough time maybe in some books. And I've spent a lot of the last year to people I think who are wise. They probably don't know it, how much I watch. Okay, how do they handle this? Oh, yeah, there I can see how he's wise. Like, he didn't take the bait. Oh, oh, I would have told like. But I've seen how wise men, how we ladies, if you look at older women, you can watch people. You just see what wisdom looks like. And I'm trying to learn that from men who I consider are wise. I've learned so much. Probably I've learned as much in the last year as I've learned through any seminary course. Just watching how wise men carry themselves. And I think this is what Timothy and all of us can see from Paul. Paul giving himself as an example. And he says, verse 7, I've kept the faith. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. He's kept the faith and endured it all. And boy, did Paul endure a lot. Look back at Paul's life and what he all endured. But we see in verse 8 that it was all worth it. Every beating, every shipwreck, all of it now is worth it. When he says in verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Isn't that what we should all aspire to accomplish? What we're all looking forward to through all the struggles, everything we wrestle with, we look forward to that day. And how do we do that? Well, if we go back to verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, who has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of our own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Because there's two parts to the Christian life, and Paul sums them up in this verse. He makes it clear, it's not about our works, right? Nothing to do with our works, that we are justified. But it's not just about earning eternal life. We're not just called to that. We also have a holy calling. Right? Holy calling? Well, that's not to eternity. Our holy calling is in the here and now. So we have here where Paul says, He has saved us. That's in the past. You've been justified. No more worry about that. Your standing with God is confirmed. You never have to look back and worry about that. But now saved to, justified to, our holy calling. That is in our present. And what is our holy calling? Well, I think here is where this message applies to everyone. Back to verse 5. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Every one of us has a ministry. It is the duty of all of us to proclaim the gospel. Sometimes it's easy to think that ministry is a vocation, right? People say, well, I'm going into the ministry. I quit my job, I'm going to go into ministry. Ministry isn't a vocation. It is the calling of every Christian to fulfill their ministry. And again, saying it's an ongoing thing. He says, fulfill your ministry, which means ongoing. It is never fulfilled until the day of your death. Everyone needs to show themselves approved before God, rightly handling uh, handling Scripture correctly. And I thought about this, if it was handling Scripture correctly, if I could use this term. There is pulpit preaching, which we usually think of. But if you let me make my own little category about small p preaching, another form, see, I'll say capital P, pulpit preaching, that's for an office. That we have clear teaching in Scripture. And yet we are all called to preach. We are all called to be heralds, to proclaim the gospel. Every man is called to be a proclaimer, to disciple those under him. 
It is the failure of any man, especially a family man, to say, well, the pastor will take care of this. I'll bring my family in Sunday morning. He'll, they'll learn under him, and yeah, at Sunday school, they'll get their teaching. No, the man is the head of the home, whether it's a business, if you're not a family person, anyone under your influence. You are called by God to proclaim the gospel, to disciple those you have been blessed to have an influence on. Same thing for women. Well, they say, all right, pulpit preaching for men, head of the home, men. So, like, yeah, we can't preach then, right? And now, so we get some pushback on that. I'm going to watch out here because touch speaking anything that exhorts women. You always got to be careful, but I'm always happy in this church. I have no worries about that. Because as the pushback comes, the pushback is now if we preach that the office is of men is, or preaching is for men. Well, they say, well, yeah, I guess if Scripture tells women to be quiet, I'm just never going to speak again. I guess I'll just keep my mouth shut. Never going to speak again. And if, if that's your engagement with the topic, then I would say, do me a favor and yes, never speak again. But, too hard. No, it's true because that's just not wanting to actually have a discussion. So, to show, I'm going to. I made my own little Mother's Day message here because you got gypped last week. So, don't think I'm not going to be generous. I did the math, in fact. I, in school, I was terrible at math. I did the O1 thing because I wanted to go play floor hockey, not be a math class. So I got out my calculator, and I, in a month or a week, there are 106, 168 hours in a week. So I subtracted one, because preaching goes on for an hour in the week. So we're down to 167 hours. So give or take, and yes, we can, whatever, distinguish all kinds of other things. But for the most part, you women, you have 167 hours in the week then where you're able to preach and proclaim the gospel to those under your influence. And I find it very interesting what's going on in our culture. As you see the rise in the fight for the pulpit by women, why get more stand on foundational scriptural teaching? Because as the rise of women to fill pulpits goes up and move up in companies and be leaders, I see an assault on motherhood. And that is why this is a serious thing. These things kind of don't stay like this. Let's lift up women, lift up women, and we'll keep a high standing of motherhood. That scale often works like this. We're losing the glory of motherhood, which is why I despise any mother, even Christian moms, if you wouldn't say it out loud, but you think it in your head. I don't, even if you have, I'm definitely women, work. Again, don't have time to make all the qualifiers work. My wife works. This isn't against having to stay at home 24-7. But I despise a mom ever saying, I'm just a mom. That's all I do. Right? These women go out and do that. But in their head, they're thinking, well, someone, what do you do? Well, I'm just a mom. Just a mom. Why wouldn't you rather think instead that I'm CEO of an 18-year program Bible college and try to see if someone stapling papers and ants doing whatever can match up with that? If someone else has as much influence as you do, having these people under your care and setting them on a path in life, being able to shepherd, disciple them. Furthermore, while I love the creator order of God, while I've been able to witness it for myself and I see these things are universal, the other thing moms have, and I think this is a universal thing, I learned in our home at least, the gift that God has given moms, if you don't think you got to 
very important role to play in discipleship is they're kind of like special forces. In our home, at least, I thought I was like going to get really smart and learn. Be ready, because my kids, I'd always have answers for them. So when they'd have questions, I'd be able to answer. But whenever I talk to them or put them to bed, they ask, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, everything's good. They go and talk about who won the hockey game. And this weird thing happens when mom comes into the room. All of a sudden, the floodgates opens, and they got questions, and I'm struggling with this, and I'm battling. Like, it is an amazing thing to watch the gift that God has given mom for discipleship. The great thing is, too, you don't need to know it all. Don't say, well, shoot, what if I don't have all the answers? No, this is a beautiful thing, how God made it to work. Because it happens now. So my wife gets to be there, and sometimes after an hour in the room, would wish she wasn't the go-to person because she can't leave. But sometimes she'll say, all right, that's a question for dad. We're going to ask dad that one. So some of them, then I'll come and help her. And sometimes if I have a question, I don't know, men, we don't need all the answers. Then I'll go find help. That's the beauty of church community. Well, we want this top-down thing, but we do want it to go top-down. We don't want pastor to preach. That's it. No pastor preaches. The power of the word. Hour on Sunday morning. Men, take that out. Lead your families, lead your homes. Women, under that, you help me, right? Lead your families because you have the gift. Who will spend more time with your children in their lifetime than you will? No one will have more hours with those kids than you will. See that as a blessing. Even on the days where you'd be like, I'd gladly give some of those hours back if I could have a break. So it may be hard to see, but that helps a bit in the back of your mind. See all those hours you get as a beautiful blessing. And it doesn't stop there. You think, hey, is this all moms, dads? We've made it. Our kids are out. Now I can relax. And if you want, whatever. Take some holidays is good. But I think Paul would say, again, fulfill your ministry. It never ends. Paul would have been about 60, and I think for Paul, that would have been a very old 60. But no matter how long he would have lived, I think Paul would have gone hard. So I'd also give this to grandparents. Think, too, the power of discipleship. I maybe thought of this and added this because I'm getting more and more examples are adding up of guys I know coming from broken homes, coming from terrible situations. And I wonder, so how did this work out like they're super thriving Christian men now? And then I ask him, like, so how would you make it out of there? I had a grandparent who wanted me to know these things. Yep, family was awful, parents split. Yep, home was a disaster. But grandma and grandpa would always be there. They were always there for me. And just the power that older people can have. And a little bit like a mother has that gift over dad sometimes. There's something about grandparents. They also get a bit of an inroad. I don't know if it's because they give candy. Maybe that's the trick. But somehow grandparents have an inroad where kids will talk to them. So I leave encouragement there too. Know that the power you can have in discipleship and gospel ministry. And then here's the payoff in verse 8. There awaits for us a crown of righteousness. Well, what is that crown of righteousness? The only mention of that, exactly that term is here by Paul. And we can often picture that golden crown, a king's crown. That's the picture we get. That's not really what is meant here. This would have been more, I think the Greek word would be Stephanos. If you think of the Olympics, Athens, kind of know those olive wreaths that would have been placed on the head? That would have been the picture here. It would have, like, to encircle, to place upon. 
That is the crown that is in mind. And you think of an Olympian when they receive this. Well, they receive that crown, but they don't really care less about the crown itself. Like, it's not like, yes, I got this circle of olive leaves. No, the beauty in it is the honor of it placing on you. Because what does that say? You've finished. Your fight is over. It is the placing on that has the power. All the hard work has paid off. And what is this crown of righteousness? Is it our works, our righteousness? It's been debated, kind of different interpretations. Could it be kind of for your ongoing perseverance? It could be in a form. Maybe that's what's in mind. But I don't think that'll really matter. Because if it is, like, don't think of, like, rewards and jewels. Like, did a lot of good works. You'll have extra jewels. And then you'll walk around heaven like, I got five. No, I think, for one, it's not the crown. And two, I think, if that is what it is, a kind of blessing for persevering, I think it'll be no different than the elders in Revelation. There'll be the, I made it. And you have that feel so good to be awarded that. And then what do you do next? Toss it away, because it's meaningless. Anything you did, you'll have no use for it. But I still, I take the side, I think this does mean the crown of righteousness. I think what is meant here is Christ's perfect righteousness. So at this moment, the race is over. Now you're about to stand before judgment and the crown of righteousness placed on you is the reward of the work of Christ. So you fought the fight. It's over. Now is coming. Now you get to accept fully the righteousness of Christ. Now you know you're eternal, invincible. Now you know you have that full power of work of Christ and Christ alone. We need to think the race to justification has been completed. So think of a race. Don't think of Christ as your coach. Don't think of him as your trainer, your partner in life running alongside you. When we're talking about your standing before God, think of the crown of righteousness you've received now that awaits you. Christ has come and said, I've already run that race and I smashed the world record And you know what? I gave you my time. It's already been recorded. So whatever you do, however fast you run, it won't make a difference. You've already crushed it. So now the glory we have, we get to run that race in full freedom. Weight off our shoulder. No more stress or guilt to hold us down. Now that life we run shouldn't be a burden. Now we get to run with full freedom. And he says, I finished the race. I finished the race. The important thing here is we see the end of verse 8. He's finished the race and says, which the Lord righteous judge will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. See, in anything else, I hate sports culture that's gone the route of participation ribbons. As long as you participate, you get a ribbon. No sport still has winners and losers. That's how it's meant to be. But here, there are no winners specifically. No one wins the race. Because Paul says, if anyone should, Paul should. Paul should be the one to get that crown then. And we're all out of luck. There's no purpose in us running. But Paul says, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but all who love is appearing. This is for everyone. So to conclude, I struggle. I wouldn't say this out loud very easily. This is a thing internally. But sometimes I watch people who have struggled with great affliction, maybe physical pain, just life that was tragedy, difficult. And just a fight from day one. And I would never want to tell them this. But sometimes I watch with a little bit of jealousy. 
Sometimes one thing I lack is that I don't hope enough for this race to be over. And I hate that about myself. That I, so far God has kind of kept me from any real persecution, any real trial. So kind of, I await this day, but like I don't await that crown the same as someone who's just, the way Paul fought, someone whose life, they're just enduring because they're clinging to the righteousness of Christ. But life, may I say on earth, is just hell for them. But they fight and they run and they fight because they're clinging to Christ. And I think of that person on this day and they'll see what Paul's seeing. Maybe they'll be lucky enough to see it coming before it comes to an end. Maybe like some saints you see, older people, as they see it about to end and have had a very hard life. Maybe some of our grandparents who definitely grew up with a hard upbringing. And what is it? Like you hear these old people talk and they just wait like, I just wish God would take me home. And you just see them. And then for those people, when it comes to an end, that's one of the most beautiful pictures I had this last week. Imagine after however many years of trial and affliction and struggle, laying it all out there. Now what that will feel like when it's over. And now Christ comes. And puts that crown on your head. That's all right. Talking about it, I am excited about it. There is a correlation between sacrifice and accomplishment. At 42, I sometimes think I'm right in that age where I'm about halfway through life, and I look back, and I've wasted a lot of life. And there's a lot of good things. It doesn't mean we just. Ministry has to be just this one thing. No, it's in the fun things, in hard work, in pro all those things are good. I mean like wasted life, like we're clearly, you're wasting your time. And one thing I pray in the next, God gives me the next half, that I'd be a lot more single fo focused and not waste the time I've wasted in the first half of my life. Always having the picture of however hard work it is, how good that will feel when the race is over. Not just working for the crown, because that is pointless, but the crowning and the crown of righteousness. So for all the goals we set, all we want to do, if I could simplify all this and just read verse 5 one last time. For every individual who trusts in Christ, make this your mission. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that is your holy calling. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for being able to preach the word in just a heavy passage that may have taken longer to work through, but I pray that it was worth it and I Thank you that we have people who would often get nervous about preaching for more than an hour. How when listening ears just want to scratch, they don't want something more than 20 minutes. But for people to sit for an hour and keep coming back, I thank you, Lord, for the receptance of your word because of the power it carries. We pray this all again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Stu. I invite you guys to stand with us. Let's sing Ferris, Lord Jesus, as we prepare to go today. We can declare in, in an amen from uh, Stu's sermon, singing in verse 1, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Let's, let's sing this now together.
salvation now and forevermore be thine. Amen. Amen. God bless you for those who go this week. We'll see you next week. Up his sleeve, the ink is putting on the ribs. Our God is an awesome God. 
There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his feet. Our God is an awesome God. Well, the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with Dumb and power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with peace. Dumb and power and love, our God is an awesome God. Mm-hmm. When the sky on the starless in the void of the night, our God is an into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. In judgment and wrath He poured out on Sodom. Mercy and grace He gave us at the cross. Hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God.